Welcome back, everybody, to episode 159 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. I'm Dan John. Um, about once a week, I sit down here and I answer questions from you wonderful people out there on, on this pl blue-green planet. Uh, small side note, uh, this week uh, here in, uh, in my neighborhood, we, we had a meteor uh, blow up above us, which uh, was kind of cool. Uh, uh, no real damage, but uh, everyone from a big area uh, wondered what had happened. So uh, I'm alive. I'm around. The end has not come. Uh, so we will do this today with podcast 159, uh, and I'm happy to be here. Remember, if you have a question, uh, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. We'll do our best to answer each and every one. Uh, this week, we have actually a, a, an interesting set of questions. Um, some of them are going to take longer answers. So uh, if you're listening while you're walking, enjoy. Uh, you're going to walk a little longer than normal. Uh, if you're, uh, We might have to cut some of these up and edit them a little bit because there are a lot of, lot of questions. So the first question comes from John T., which is a great name. Uh, I have started Easy Strength and I've already seen great results getting two personal records on my first day of six singles, performing a rep with 36, uh, 35K on the ring chin-up and deadlifting 180K, both uh, personal records by 10 uh, kilograms. Thank you very much for what you've done in developing the system, as this has brought me great joy. Well, good. Thank you. You're welcome. However, I have struggled a bit with the overhead press, and, and I got to stop you right there. So uh, look at this, and I want you to listen in, folks, for those of you who actually follow my work. Uh, John T. Uh, doing easy strength got uh, personal records in the pull and the hinge. And as if you've been listening to my work, you know that I've been breaking people down into pushers, pullers, hingers, squatters. And it's not perfect, no. But a person like myself, I'm a, I'm a push hinger uh, on easy strength. My push went through the ceiling. My hinge went through the ceiling. My squat uh, didn't go much. I dedicate three chapters in my new book to this concept. Uh, and they all don't, it's funny because the chapters don't necessarily agree with each other because that's the way it goes. So John T emails us and he, and he got a PR and, and a pull and a, and a hinge, uh, like my friend Pavel, um, the pull hingers and their press doesn't go up. And for me, my press goes up. I don't know if I eat a carrot, I guess it's pretty easy. Um, I came into the program following some time on a basic bodybuilding program. So I have struggled a bit on the overhead press. I did a basic bodybuilding program centered around squats and presses, which culminated in pressing 60 kilograms, I think it's times eight he's trying to do there, with a couple in the tank. When it came time for an overhead press singles here, I was a little disappointed as I ended up missing 70K when I was expected to be in the 75 to 80. Well, there's going to be two issues I want to talk about, and I want, I'll, I'll let's get through all your all your paragraphs here. Am I just being impatient? Well, yeah. Expecting rep strength to translate into singles so quickly, well, especially in the overhead press, yeah. But we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, or is this a little less than you would have expected based on your previous uh, lift of 60 times 8? Um, I guess I'm going to have to remember that other point, too, is that this idea that reps correlate to, to max, uh, single rep max, uh, is always fraught with issues. So, um, Considering my other lifts with easy strength, we're progressing very well. Uh, he's wondering about the press. I think I've been doing the lifts at a similar intensity. Two times five has typically been using 10 kilos for the chin-up, 50 for the press, and 110 for the deadlift. So I'm not sure what to attribute this to. I'm going to continue with the program and see what awaits me, but I'd love to hear. Well, um, you know, we, we actually discussed this, uh, the, the people I work with. And uh, one of the people said that, well, this is an annoying question. And uh, hold you know, it, it's not. Uh, John T., here's the deal. In, and it, the video's on uh, YouTube somewhere, but I, I break down, I go to a wall in my gym and I, and I have push, pull, hinge, squat on the wall. 
And basically, in my experience, now, obviously, you know, I've only been doing this since 1965. I've been coaching since 79. So what, anytime I make a, a, a statement like I'm about to say, there's always somebody comes in and says, you know, that their N equals one experience uh, trumps everything I just said. But many of the throwers I worked with in my career are push hingers. They're great at bench press, skater overhead, can deadlift, clean, and snatch, and then struggle with the squat. And of course, if you want to be an Olympic lifter, you'd better have your squat uh, dialed in. Rock climbers tend to be pole squatters. Uh, like I mentioned a, a minute ago, my friend Pavel, when I told him this idea, he said, uh, pole, he's a pole hinger. And I'm not saying it's perfect, and I certainly don't think it summarizes every all the billions of us on the planet, but it's an insight. And John T., just looking at your the, the way you very quickly got your hinge and uh, uh, the, your the your pole, whatever the, I don't remember what the exact variation, the ring, something or other. Uh, I'm guessing you're, you're a pole hinger. So yeah, you're going to move ahead on that. Uh, I can do all kinds of variations of pull up programs and stuff, uh, to the point that I can barely even straighten out my arms because of, uh, maps, middle age pull up syndrome and my pull up nudges nowhere. Um, <laughs> I can, I can, <laughs> I can smoke a cigarette and press the beast a whole bunch of times because I just can press. So first and foremost, let's just say this straight up. Um, you might just be a pole hinger and it means that you're gonna struggle. The second issue is when you get to the overhead press and everybody discovers this who takes pressing overhead military press seriously, is that's a lot easier to bank a bunch of reps than it is to do a max single. Uh, what do I mean by that? And we'll come back to that in just a minute. but. You know, if all I had for men was two standards, they would be this. Clean and press body weight, snatch body weight uh, with a barbell. And and the reason I say that is uh, just in my career and in my experiences talking, to, just seeing what I've seen, when you can clean and press and snatch your body weight, you're kind of recognizably strong, flexible, mobile, you know, all the, all the qualities you're going to get. And it's just a nice little line there. But what's weird is, you know, if you have somebody who weighs, uh, we'll just make up some numbers. You have somebody who weighs 80 kilos, uh, very often they get right up to 60, they get right up to 70. And then the road from 70 to 80 kilos body weight, I mean, 60 to 70 is, I mean, it's measured in weeks, you know. And yet getting up to 80 is probably measured in months or even years. It's just one of those things. Overhead pressing, there's not a lot of tricks to it. I mean, I mean, you can certainly you can lean back, you can pump with your knees, and you can, you know, bounce and all that stuff. But a strict press, there's just not a lot of tricks to it. Um, and then the final thing I just want to say, so first off, you just might be wired to be better at the pull and, and deadlift. Number two. The overhead press universally is hard on the top end. And then number three, I just want to bring this up because I think it's important. Uh, be very careful of using uh, high reps to indicate that your top end is going up. I've shared many times my my friend, the late, great uh, Lane Cannon, uh, whom, I, whom I truly care a lot. Um, tragic death. Um, you know, he famously got his uh, trap bar deadlift. He was trained. He was training like a hard gainer, which he didn't need to do. He was certainly no hard gainer. So he got his trap bar deadlift up to twenty reps with four hundred five. So you know, so twenty reps with one hundred and eighty three kilos. And then he said, "Well, I'm going to go max." Well, his max twenty reps with four hundred five, one hundred and eighty three kilos. Goes to max out another week. He gets a single with 425. 194, 195 kilos. In other words, 20 reps had no, you would, you would just mentally would assume, well, that it's got to be good for 500, 600. 
He was so frustrated by that experience with the hard gaining training methods of run, one rep to failure and all that stuff. He called me up and, and honestly, I mean, it was, and then we started training together and I, and I just got him back to the traditions of just lifting weights. And his deadlift obviously shot through the moon right after that. Using reps to calculate max. Just, you know, at the Nationals, you know, famously back when was it, 2001, 2002, you know, there's a weight on the bar out there in the platform. If I make that lift, I'm national champion. If I miss that lift, I take fourth. Yeah. I made the damn lift, you know. And, but, you know, somebody would have said, you know, some of these online people, well, you should have been able to do, you know, blank, you know, 90% of that for three reps. And I'm like, no, I have an article on this. Uh, it's on T Nation. It's also in most of my books. It's called Max, 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 oh, wait, sort of Max, 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 or something like that. But the idea is that only the... The longer you're in the game, the less correlation you're going to find between those high rep sets and your max. Um, early, uh, you know, like when I was in the eighth, ninth grade, when I was first lifting 12, 13, um, I would get a set of eight with the 90 pound. And I'd go to 100 and I'd miss the lift. Okay. Uh, later, you know, <laughs> I would have a max 400 and. 360, you know, two weeks later would be unmovable. It's just the way uh, reps go. It's a good question. Um, just remember, easy strength works well, but you also have to dance with the way you're built and kind of even the way you're wired. When I mean wired, I mean, I like, I like to do explosive work, but I don't like endurance. So I'm kind of wired to prefer to do Olympic lifts than to run uh, a marathon. This is the way I'm kind of wired. So it's just an idea, just a thought. So if that helps, great. And thank you so much. Okay, our next question is from Will. I spent the first half of the year doing the 10,000 swing challenge. Okay, now, and this is funny because when I first read this, I thought it took him six months to do the 10,000 10, swing challenge. And then, but the, I, 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 miss, I missed the point. The getting started with Olympic lifting, the program on Dan John University, which I found to be a phenomenal place to start learning the Olympic lifts. Thank you. Uh, easy strength uh, for fat loss with Olympic lifting. And I'm about to finish up the Southwood program. Okay, so he's done, you know, five or six programs this year, which which is much nicer considering we're well over halfway past the year. Uh, I was thinking about spending some time doing unilateral training to give the barbell a break and see if I can pinpoint any imbalances and correct them, at least minimize them. Given that you can't personally assess me, what are the biggest imbalances you see in a general population and what's your prescription for them? Do you like an easy strength protocol or something else more effective? Uh, I'm going to answer this question in a minute, but I, you've got to hear this. Um, most of the time, I'm going to tell you to use the workout generator if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, you're going to use easy strength if you're going to go in with a good focused reason for why you're doing it. Like fat loss, the Olympic lifting. Uh, and you, you just want to get stronger at, or maintain your strength during a season. That's the joy of easy strength. Okay, just, just keep that in mind. I was thinking about doing half kneeling press, okay, single leg deadlift, TRX single arm row. A single arm carry, a suitcase, waiter, rack, yeah. And either kettlebell clean or snatch. I know you're not a huge fan of lunges. How do you feel about split squats? Yeah. As I write this, I think you might tell me to head to the workout generator. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I am. And the nice thing about the workout generator, uh, especially in the way you've kind of uh, put this together, Will, is that you can choose all those single side exercises. Um, yeah, I, I, I actually, if you read my book intervention, which, you know, which is my foundation of the way my brain works, 
By the way, you don't need to. It's the, the workout generator is the book intervention. It's just with AI. Um, and then you read, uh, that my, uh, experienced athletes approach to, uh, uh, easy strength, you'll notice that time and again, I have week three being just one-sided stuff. Uh, and what we're looking for on the one-sided stuff, Will, is you said imbalances. And there's there's two, I like that because uh, I know when I press, uh, I know when I press, my right side is stronger than my left. I know when I pull my left side, if I'm doing unilateral, my left side is stronger than my right. And the reason is all those years of being a thrower. Um, a couple couple quick rules uh, if you're going to do unilateral training. The first is chin, sternum, zipper. The, I call it the CSZ line. I like it to stack straight up the whole time. Um, so if you're doing an exercise, even something like a, a, a you call, did you call it a straight leg or a single leg deadlift, the whole time you're doing them, I would like your chin, your sternum, and your zipper to stay in a straight line. I, I watch these clowns on uh, on the internet all the time, and they'll be doing these heavy uh, single leg stuff, and then you'll see that the the head start tweaking away, you know. And I, I'm always concerned about that because under load with just one single stability item, with your foot, you twist away like that. Uh, a moment of imbalance, uh, someone slams a door, something, you know, I just think that puts you in a tough situation. Uh, my good friend Stu McGill up there in Canada has been telling me about these weird injuries that he's getting from, from these new clients uh, be, because these personal trainers are having people do things um, to excess that the human body just needs a little bit more time <laughs> preparing for before you just throw them under the bus, so to speak. Um, I, I'm going to ask you to use the workout generator and, and pick the single side stuff. Um, keep an eye on the C as Z. And then the next bit of advice I want you to do is use the arm or limb side that's not as strong as the other to dictate the reps. So, um, so if I'm pressing the beast, and it's true, San Jose uh, RKC, I pressed it 13 times. 13, 48 kilos, one-handed 13 times. Everyone watched it. It was pretty impressive. At the time, I could probably do one or two with my left. Okay? Now, so if we're pressing the beast, and I go one here and I can't do any more, then I would only do one with this arm. And that is to keep that. So... What's going to happen is if you just train, uh, you know, three sets of eight, I don't know, well, what happens usually is that people always have imbalances, okay? And if you train, you know, kind of the standard normal way, the way I trained most of my career, when you, you do raise up, but you still have that big gap between imbalances. If you let the lesser, weaker side, I, mean, I hate to call it weaker side, it's really not. It's just the way you're, you're wired. You've been wiring this side up better. And maybe this side has more injuries too, as a discus. What I don't want you to do is increase your strength and keep that same gap of imbalance. Now, it's never going to be perfect. Um, the human body, and the, I got this from my good friend Taylor Lewis, it is asymmetrical, you know. The heart's on this side. I mean, how many livers do you have? You have one. Uh, your lungs, you've got two lobes on one side and three on the other. And I don't remember how it goes, uh, which one is which. Uh, I think you only have one pancreas. You have two kidneys, and they're, by the way, they're much higher than people think. Um, a lot of stuff is not symmetrical. So we are built, and there's an advantage to it. If you want to throw the disc as far, you want to have a really strong left leg uh, vertical brace, and you want to whip that right side around, you know, as, you know, just like a bow and arrow. Well, that's going to have that's going to cause imbalances over a forty or fifty year throwing career, uh, uh, Im imbalances, asymmetries, whatever you want to call it. This week, uh, what are the big imbalances I see with the, you know, everybody else community, the general pop? 
Well, it's nothing new. Now, I guess there's some people who don't like the work of Vladimir Yonda. When I was in England, that would be three years ago, uh, when my brother died, someone put a little post up on uh, Instagram and critiqued me for talking about Yonda. Now, the next day when I spoke and I called out the audience, raise your hand, the person who did that, no one put their hand up. I wonder why. But Yonda, uh, I've always found that Yonda's template is, is right. Uh, I'll just do the simple ones. As most people age, the biceps, the pecs, the hip flexors, the hamstrings tighten up. And I just turned myself into an, a, a very old man. The glutes, gluteal amnesia, saggy bottom, they weaken. The deltoids weaken, the triceps weaken, the ab wall weaken. So to me, globally standing back, if there's, if I have a thousand Americans in a room, I can almost say, okay, y'all need to do hip thrust, goblet squats, overhead pressing, and the ab wheel. I, 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 and maybe suitcase carry. That's not a bad workout. I can almost just say that. And then flexibility work, we're going to do what I call the stony stretch. Uh, it's a pec and hip flexor stretch. A hip flexor stretch. I wouldn't necessarily stretch the hamstrings because there's, it's built in on some of the movements we'd move to. But if you had a, if you had a hinged hamstring flex, just see my other videos. Um, those are the biggest imbalances when you go like this. Okay. In North America, the, the biggest imbalance I would see is the inability of men to do pull-ups as well as their European count. In Europe, I would say it's the inability of men to do overhead pressing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North Americans. Um, the, the bigger areas of imbalance I see, it, it, it would go, if you don't mind, if you don't mind a little bit more on that, uh, is the imbalances of lifestyle. Lack of meditation, lack of quality sleep, man. It's free. It's free. And it feels great. And it does remarkable things to your brain. And if your brain's healthy, your hormone system is healthy, your your nervous system is healthy, you're better, you're smarter. You're, um, the imbalances come in the areas of, of, of restoratives like sleep, meditation, um, you know, uh, you know, drinking water. Uh, this isn't water; it's coffee, but it's still fine. Mmm, Folgers crystals, the best guy. Um, my, my afternoon coffee is always the crystals, which is, reminds me why I percolate in the morning. Um, yeah, it's those, those, it, it, so Yonda's information generally, and then the other imbalances are what Sister Maria Sumpta taught us, taught me in the second grade, work, rest, play, and pray. Um, uh, just an imbalance globally of life. Uh, you know, uh. Oh, it's in the other room now. But well, here's one of Maffy Tone's books. Here, Phil Maffy Tone's. You know his, his, you know his ability. You know w what training is is workout and recovery. You know Bill Bowerman. He has that funny line in the book where, you know, I can't remember what he calls typical freshman. Take any idiot freshman, and if you work them hard and then rest, they improve. And the thing is, many people forget the rest part. Many per people forget the play part, alone time, and those kinds of things. Those are the imbalances I see. I enjoyed that question. Thank you. We have a question from Ben. I've been working a full-time office job for a couple of years now, and I realized that after spending 40 plus hours each week on a computer for a decade, my right shoulder now sits noticeably lower than my left and lifts forward quite significantly. This has gotten to the point where, in addition to being a constant pain and tension around my right shoulder blade. Wow. <clears throat> this is to me almost right away, Ben. I don't want before I even get going, but, uh, this, this might be worth your time to see a good physical trainer or physio. I don't know where you live, but, uh, uh, or even a, a, a chiropractor. There might be something, there might be something, a structural issue that's out of my, that's out of my ballpark. But maybe there's a structural injury issue based on an old injury. It could also be the way you sleep. I can't tell you how many people <laughs> I had actually a person today I had to help because they slept funny last night and they needed some. So I got the massage gun at them and wonder of wonder, miracle of miracles, the massage gun uh, fixed them up. 
um, I cannot keep my arms and shoulder joints moving symmetrically, even on basic movements such as push-ups or pull-ups. Okay, Ben, I'm going to have to ask you to go get uh, some hands-on care for this. Um, if an x-ray and an MRI will help, that's great. Uh, it, but I, I can almost guarantee, and those of us who have been athletes long enough, um, one of the things is if you have good people, they can touch you and basically, I mean, I, I've been with some quality trainers and they, they, they can just go, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's right out of wax on wax off. I mean, it's just like your Abdullah and Bugatti is, you know, extending across the periphery and then what here, go like this. <coughs> ah, thank you. Uh, my man, you know, he has me just do. I don't know if you heard that, but I just I just undid all the damage uh, my whole day right there with those double cracks, and that's how fast I can cure mine. But, but you have to have somebody good in order to contradict contract this. <laughs> sorry, contract. I have been quite diligent about starting my day with a 15 minute original strength mobility routine, which is great for the hips and certain exercises for the shoulders. I'd like to see which one you're doing. And I've adjusted my train for more asymmetrical loading. Uh, again, same question. The, the, uh, the suitcase carries half kneeling kettlebell press as well as hanging and training absolutely makes my upper back feel better. Okay. But then I have to spend another eight hours in that same left arm back on the keyboard, right arm forward in the mouse position, reinforcing the posture. I just spent an hour trying to get rid of and by the end of the day, it's like I never did anything to improve. Turns out one hour of good stuff can't undo eight hours of bad stuff. Boy, that's a life lesson, isn't it? Um, is there anything else you'd recommend for somebody in my position short of dropping everything and becoming a goat herder in the Carpathian Mountains? Yeah, I like that idea, but a goat. Yeah, I like that. Um, it seems to me that Instead of doing the one hour workout, you're going to need more doses of, of, of the shoulder work. Uh, one exercise that Tim Anderson gave me when I was getting ready for my last, uh, oh, this would be, this would be a couple years ago with, for an Olympic lifting meet. Uh, that was the meet where I pulled my hamstring going in. And, but there is an, there is a movement in, in yoga is called the child's pose, but, uh, it, in, in, in the original strength style, or in a rock. And I'm thinking you should do this. I'd love to have you do this every hour on the hour, but it's a much gentler hang. So you're gonna get into the rock, you're gonna push your back all the, your butt all the way back. I think it would probably be better for you to have your shoelaces down versus your toes dug in, but you can experiment with both. But then what I want you to do is in that, deep rock position, instead of having the arms in the push-up position, maybe even take them and put them in a, in a diamond like this and stretch out and then rock and pulse that shoulder, those shoulders in and out. I stick my head in to give myself just a little bit more uh, T-spine mobility, very similar to that exercise that uh, Stu McGill uses to open up that area. But it's it's not a forced exercise. It's maybe it's maybe 10 like that. Child's pose, six point rock pose, shoelaces down. Slide your hands forward in a triangle. It'll make sense when you do it why I have it in a triangle. Uh, and then when you get in that position, you're gonna rock. It's hard for me to rock chair but you're going to rock and gently bring your chest and head through to maybe open things up this is this is a short-term answer to a, a, a longer problem but one of the things i want you to think about is that maybe you should start hanging before and after work and then throwing maybe five or six bouts of what i just told you to do now i know you're in an office but uh, the other thing you'd also do is you probably could just walk over to a door frame and do what we used to do as school teachers. 
uh, I was surprised how it was a universal thing for school teachers to do at the end of long days. You go up to a, your, your door jam, and you put your hands up there, and you just kind of push your, and, uh, and then you see the teacher go, ah, oh, that's what I needed because of all the tension that we hold up there. Everything I'm telling you is pretty simple. As always, I don't think it's a bad idea for you to see a, a good hands person. I mean, I don't know what your situation was, uh, a good massage, a good chiropractor, a good PT, a good physio, uh, <laughs> whatever, whatever you'd like. Uh, somebody that can help you. Uh, Larie Draper uses the word pendiculate. Use that to teach yourself to pump yourself. Um, Greg Rose calls it distraction to pump yourself uh, free into position, okay? Okay, uh, this name's a little hard, but oh, it's uh, he's from the Czech Republic, so that makes more sense. Uh, I think it's Andre. I would like to ask about the Southwood program. I love your story of Southwood. I have high school and junior team in weight room. We don't do it yet because we are teaching hang clean. Now, that's interesting, Andre, because I got taught the hang clean and by the way, it should be from the floor if you're doing Southwood. Um, I got taught by my teammates, uh, but I'll talk about it. How do you solve the mobility wrist issues in the clean and front squats? Well, if they're, do it. What do I know? Guys, wrists hurt when cleaning. We all front squat from rack and some wrist guys go with crossed arm position. How do you feel about that? Do you have any trick? Thanks a lot. I love your wisdom. Okay, so Southwood, I went, I just graduated from St. Veronica's and, uh, oh my God, there's, uh, maybe I should share a picture of me. You know, I was, a, I was probably 110 pounds and I put on about eight pounds over the summer. So 118 pounds and it was 52 kilos, 53, I guess. Uh, and, you know, I showed up to play American football and to get ready. My teammates, uh, Paul Bactall and Jeff Lara, Lara uh, showed me um, their program they used at the high school, at, at, probably at the junior high. And, and I, ever since then, since it was called Southwood Junior High, I called it the Southwood program. And, you know, it was weird because, you know, I'd already been reading Strength and Health, but I was basically just doing, uh, you know, a bunch of junk exercises you could do with dumbbells and... Uh, a 50 kilo barbell, 110. Um, so w there was power cleans, eight, six, four. There was one power clean and then press, eight, six, four in the military. One power clean and front squat, eight, six, four. And then uh, it, we work in a group and do bench press, eight, six, four. We also warmed up with a, uh, with a run, an obstacle course, a lot of calisthenics. Now, Andre's question is tough for me um, because I think it's okay to go through the wrist issues as a youth and let it bother him a little bit. Uh, one of the issues very often, especially in the teen group, is they don't actually jump the bar up. They kind of do that deadlift reverse curl. So instead of having the weight up here with, and then just you know living on uh, the flexibility of their fingers and wrist, they have the weight here and they hold it like this. And then they try to bring those arms up and there's nowhere, there's no, there's no place to move. So yeah, I don't like that uh, crossed arm style. Um, if, if, but here's the thing. Um, you got to do what you got to do. Personally, long term, I think it's better to learn. As we always say, you know, the hard, the hard road is always faster than the shortcut. So when you're teaching these kids to do this, and by the way, how are you going to get the damn weight up there? Uh, get rid of the racks. If you're going to use this program, get the racks out of there, except for bench press. In fact, I would say get the racks out of there, even for uh, bench press. If you actually read the articles uh, versus just point things off as people do, um, if I'm benching, uh, I have a side spotter here and a side spotter here and a head spotter here. I laid down, the side spotters picked it up, made sure it was safe. The head, the head spotter would, you know, say, okay. And then I would get my eight reps in. When I finished my eighth, the side spotter and the head spotter would guide it back to the floor. And then we would rotate around. 
your rest period was the other three athletes uh, doing their sets. And I like that because it taught us how to spot and it taught us not be not to be idiots because, you know, if you were screwing around and you, you know, spit, you know, I've seen kids spit on each other, you know, shake their hair down, sweat hair down on the kids while bench pressing. Kids are jerks. There, I said it. And, and y'all know I'm right. Uh, well, here's the thing. You don't do, you'll, you'll do that. And then of course you're, you're in, you know, in just a few seconds, it's your turn. And now, you know, now I'm going to spit the idiotic thing teenagers are doing now. Um, it's a good program. The, the Southwood program is good. Uh, I've had adults do it and they they always come away with, that was a lot harder than I thought. Uh, it's got a, you know, it's got a short shelf life. You know, you could probably go five or six weeks on it, but, and then it'd be time to move on. Uh, at Southwood, we did it for six week bouts, I think a couple of times a year, but it's a, it's a good program. Uh, I still stand by it. And I guess I'll stand by it forever because I did this program, what, 1971 and 1972. And here it is in uh, 2022, as I'm saying this, and I'm still recommending it. So, I don't know, that's what, about 50 years? So I've been doing this program, recommending the program, doing it, coaching it, teaching it for 50 years. I have a full article over at the T Nation. It's also in my book, uh, Never Let Go, on the Southwood program. I did have one or two people criticize it because the one, uh, we had an active shooting at the school I was at. It was weird because uh, I was told later on by all the students that they all felt the safest place in the facility would have been the weight room with me. And there was some truth to that, uh, but it was, and some people didn't like it, but I got to say this from the heart. If any of you are ever in a school and there's an active shooter uh, and you have to wait those hours to find out if your own children are still okay and your godchildren who are teachers at the school, uh, once you've gone through that, then tell me how macho you it was a tough one. And that got dark. Huh, sorry. Okay, let's move on. Gavin, my son Leo has shown an interest in starting training. Um, I need to see an age on it. Uh, I was thinking about a body weight program three times a week, which also uses a wooden dowel to learn some lifts. He is 11, so I'm just looking to set him up for when he can start using weights. And he, uh, Gavin says 14 ish. I was already lifting by that age. Uh, he is a fit kid, plays football, and trains kickboxing twice a week. Um, it's interesting how parents will do that. So it's okay. It's they're worried about the dangers of lifting weights, but kickboxing twice a week is fine. I'm not ripping on you, Gavin. I'm just saying I see this kind of thing all the time. Uh, yeah, we want our little Billy to play American football. Okay, good. So here's the lifts. Aren't those lifts dangerous? Uh, American football? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, um, I, I like to jump out of planes, uh, but I'm worried that uh, squats will hurt my knees, you know, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, we've got a great relationship. I'd like to keep it that way. And that's the thing. I'm glad you said that, Gavin. And I have great respect for that line. You get it. And there are going to be a couple of tough years ahead of you, you know, uh, part of the child's development is to separate so it's good it always is an uncomfortable time for parents I'm, i'll keep reading i don't want to set him on the wrong path i want to have a positive effects training gives mental and physical but i don't want one do any harm two be pushy and make it boring three set him up for being a gym shark wearing bro playing in a steroid cycle at 15. i have no clue what the best approach is but as any self-respecting son, he pesters me daily. Wow. So we have a question. How do you help your child in sports and weightlifting without ruining the relationship? Hi, I'm Dan, the father of my own athletes. I gotta tell you, it is the hardest 
uh, relationship I've ever had as a coach. Uh, they both did very well athletically, but it, it, at times is brutal. It's just, you're just too close. Um, it's almost like they have to learn to respect your knowledge, and that's a tough one. If, and I, and I tell this to people all the time, if a child shows interest in weightlifting, let them come on in and let them show them one or two things. Whatever they're interested in, let them do it, correct as appropriate, and say, wow, that looks good. That, that, it'll get better the more you do it, you know. But you just, that's great. You're doing fine. Uh, Dan John would respect that goblet squat. Uh, I would suggest always trying to stay with the movements that are full. Uh, anything that goes from the floor to overhead. Uh, picking things up off the floor, putting them up overhead. Um, anytime you go overhead, you're going to have those built-in governors. <laughs> uh, that That's going to stop a lot of the problems. Um, I was watching a boy not long ago, and it kind of inspired me a little bit. It reminded me of the first time I pressed 65, and this kid was out there struggling to to clean and press the the the, the Olympic bar with 10-pound plates on both sides. And it reminded me of the first time I did that. I was with my neighbor, Kim, and, you know, he was, he was older than me and he was pressing it easily and my little competitive side kicked in and I couldn't, I could, and I finally got it. And then within weeks, I was stronger than him uh, because that's the way uh, progressive resistance exercise happens. Um, I would give you the advice uh, from that, my good friend Mike Rosenberger and I came up with, oh, 20 years ago almost, uh, maybe longer now. Um, pick weights up, put them overhead, carry them for time or distance, and there's your program. Anytime there's weights on the ground, you can show them a, a variety of ways to pick them up. You can show them a few ways to put them overhead. And then, of course, you can do suitcase carries, farmer walk, deadlift carries, which is a great, uh, uh, you know, bear hug carries. Any carry is going to be fun, and people don't get hurt doing carries, but boy, they get tired fast. Uh, if he wants to do curls and skull crushers, then you just, you know, I would suggest you say, okay, curls and skull crushers have a place, but you're going to get a lot farther by bear hug carries. Oh, by the way, I got a critique the other day. Somebody wrote something about the fact that I'm not a big fan of isolation exercises. And, and the truth is, at the elite level, you see almost none of it. But, you know, this, this person who had a, you know, an anonymous name on YouTube is obviously more of an expert. Uh, it's really hard for me to take anonymous seriously. Uh, I love that uh, little thing uh, Mark Twight does on his site. If you post anonymously, it's your, it, the name always comes up, anonymous coward. I think that's hilarious. So there you go. You know, pick weights up, put them overhead, carry from time or distance. Remind yourself and him constantly that a weight training is complementary to other training, uh, as in it assists, it holds up, it supports. And long term, uh, anything he learns now is going to be like uh, putting money in the bank back in the day when you got 5%. Uh, it's just going to, it's just going to start building on itself. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. And I appreciated the question. We got a question from Andrew. Uh, have you had any interesting experiences with concentric only weight training? I remember you saying that for Olympic lifting, you felt that there was value in the old school approach of having to lower the bar rather than just dropping it. Outside of that context, you think there's any other benefits? Okay. Do you mean, I think concentric is when I'm applying force. Eccentric is when you're slowing it down. Um, I, I, what I thought there was value with, uh, with the Olympic lifts, not just dropping them, but bringing them down slowly, <clears throat> would be the eccentric strength. Now, oh gosh, 50 years ago, eccentric training was, was the, was the new buzz thing. Uh, there was, there was a Finnish Olympic lifter who did a bunch of it. Uh, turns out later, 
that that wasn't true, but you know, a lot of us started doing these negative only stuff. Uh, is there value in negative only training? Um, you know, I certainly like to say there is, uh, except it doesn't, it's, it's a really hard thing to do. You need really good spotters. You need really good spotters and you really need to have uh, some experience, uh, uh, lifter, coach, spotters. Is there value in bringing weights down slowly, emphasizing the concentric part? I, I think that's why certain exercises are so good, uh, to be honest with you. Um, as I'm looking at this, Andrew, you know, one of the reasons I like, uh, well, I have this, I used to have it, I, it was my Saturday workout where, where we would do overhead squats, um, we were doing at the time what we called stiff or straight leg deadlifts. I would recommend more a Romanian deadlift now. So overhead squat, Romanian deadlift, uh, dip, uh, a pull up variation that could be chin ups, could be anything. And then, uh, side bends. And this is before the suitcase carry. So we had side bends. And the reason I like those exercises is that all of them demands, like, for example, when I'm doing a dip, I have to, I can't, well, I guess you could just do drop dips. I, I wouldn't, I, you know, but you have to have control coming down and control going up. Pull-ups, I, I don't know if you could just do a pull-up and then go, bah, and just, you know, I, I guess you could. I mean, you could do anything. I don't know if you'd survive, but. And so what I liked about that particular workout, Andrew, is that you were getting, you were getting that built-in eccentric, concentric uh, dance. Um, of course, I believe in negatives and isometric work. I do. Uh, having said that, those to me would be more, I, I'm going to give you the cliches. Uh, it's, it's the icing on the cake kind of stuff. It doesn't mean there's not a value to it. And at a certain place in your career, there's a lot of value to it. Um, you know, you, my experiments with Dave Turner's isometric, uh, just, Changed my whole career, but that worked for six weeks, and it probably won't even work ever again in that particular range. So yeah, it's there's value to it. There's value to everything we do, but most people will find that you know progressive resistance exercise, you know, doing the you know fundamental human movements is going to be the ticket to most of your improvement. And then there's going to be those other things that are going to assist. And sometimes because of that, it's hard to see the impact they're going to have. And like in my case with the dead stop front squats, Dave Turner's program, it, it changed my whole career as an Olympic lifter six weeks. And then it never helped again. I'm glad we did it, but it was a one time off and we're done kind of. Gosh, I hope that helped. Thanks so much. Okay. Now, this is one of those questions that, you know, it's me because I get these questions and I'm honored. Omar asks a question. Yeah. You're one of the few that speaks about the importance of bowel movements, regular, and based on your nudges and my own uh, regularity, bowel movement regularity, I apologize. And based on your nudges and my own health journey, I started taking psyllium husk daily and uh, making homemade kefir for probiotic. My regularity has improved essentially daily now. Just once a day. Yeah. And I feel unbelievably better and lighter. Yeah, well, there you go. And my waist size has come down a couple of inches. Money, money, money. I'm a believer. That said, I'm still in the trial and error phase of figuring out just how much psyllium husk to take. Okay, this isn't going to help because I don't, well, but I'm, I'll, I'll read it off. I'm currently taking 10 milligram of psyllium husk powder first thing in the morning and again in the mid-afternoon. I also take half a cup of kefir in the morning. 20 milligrams a day seems a bit too high, but I'm also not sure. Any insights or advice would be great on both the husk and the probiotic. Well, I mean, of all the probiotics you're going to use, I mean, kefir, uh, there's, 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 I mean, I don't know, but for me, I mean, my real... My real changes in the gut biome happened when I started eating more sauerkraut and more uh, kimchi. A lot of kimchi. I mean, a lot of kimchi. Um, 
we know this is that if you can get you, so it's now basically we say fiber, fermented food, Let me just say it this way. The research is clear that fermented foods and additional fiber seem to help. Where you can get a lot of fiber? Vegetables. Uh, you're using psyllium seed, the husks. Uh, I use I use the package brand called uh, Orange Flavored Sugar-Free Metamucil. A friend of mine gave me a piece of advice not long ago, uh, a dietary piece. And it's, by the way, it's on the it's on the canister. It's that same thing. Uh, this person was taking. Uh, a serving uh, Metamucil, the full serving, before every meal, every, in snack too. And it causes you to have some, you know, it makes you feel a little fuller. And it also seems to uh, assist in that, uh, the bowel movement area. Just remember, it's fermented food and fiber. And the, uh, I still think the best source of fiber is vegetables. Um, you know, the cauliflowers, the broccolis and things like that. Having said that, uh, I have also used many times in my life, uh, fiber cereals. Now they don't always agree with me. Um, but, um, you know, here's one in the States called fiber one and there's, there's multiple flavors on it now. And, you know, if you, you could go down that road, but for me, from what my experience is with most of the clients I work with, kimchi, sauerkraut, um, coffee's a fermented food, wine's a fermented food, beer is a fermented food, cheese, tea, uh, the list. I don't think humanity would survive without fermented foods. Um, but it's going to be fermented food on one side, and you're already doing that. And then on the other side, uh, increasing your fiber. Um, I think uh, I eat vegetables at every single meal. And at first people make fun of me. And I always love it when people make fun of me. And then, then the next, they'll, they'll say, why do I eat so weird? Or why do I do this or that? And then the, a minute later, it's like, God, you look good for 65. I, I blush. And it's like, God, do you even listen to yourself? Uh, eat, I eat vegetables at every meal. Uh, my go-to breakfast is a vegetable omelet, and it's the one I eat has 10 to 12 different vegetables in it. Uh, every meal, I try to shovel more in. I try to have a variation. I experiment with vegetables I've never seen before, and, and those are the big ones. Um, I, I like the idea, by the way, and I've done this myself. I'm not right now because I'm in the middle of a, I'm doing a, a special diet called the Velocity Diet. So it's a little different right now for 28 days, and I'm halfway through it. Um, by the time you hear this, all, it'll be behind me. But, you know, for the most of the time, if I focus on, and I think this is true for everybody, vegetables every meal, uh, Coke, you know, plenty of water, uh, Metamucil, uh, generally about twice a day. Um, everything seems to be okay, but it's the combination. So, you know, at dinner, I have a massive pile of kimchi plus a bunch of other vegetables. I order, if I go out to eat, I always, always order a side of sauerkraut. If I go to a German restaurant, I always get those, the, the, the red cabbage that they have that I like so much. And very often I'll order double and triple orders. And it's funny because I often don't. They don't get charged for it because I just think they go, oh, whatever, throw it on top. So, yeah, I think there's a huge value in it. And that's how you fix your gut health long term. The interesting thing, and I know I'm rambling on a little bit, and I apologize, is that I think when you fix your gut health, you also impact your brain. And uh, we've known that for a long time. People have been saying, I went with my gut on a, on, a, on a question. And now there's some research that says that's not just a phrase. There's probably some truth to it. So thank you, Omar. I thought that was a good question. Um, since I don't know what brand or what you're doing, and I don't know if there's directions on your psyllium husk, I can't recommend, I can't really give you quality recommendations. 
but I can say I think you're on the right track, okay? Well, that's it. Uh, there you go. Um, each and every week, uh, I invite you all to uh, send in questions. Remember, if you have a question, you send them to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. I thought this week's questions were outstanding. And I've noticed in the past little bit, the questions keep getting better and better and better. And I applaud you, my audience, for that. Thanks so much, and we'll talk again soon. And until then, keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.